We're going to go ahead and start this morning or today or this evening, whatever time zone you happen to be in. Uh, hello, and thank you all for taking the time to join us today. My name is Ryan Loomis, and I'm here with my colleague Heidi Holtz. We are both research analysts in CNA's China and Indo-Pacific Security Affairs Division. And we're very glad to have this opportunity to tell you about our recently completed research into gaps that exist between the stated policies and rhetoric of the People's Republic of China and the illicit maritime activities that some PRC actors, vessels, companies, and other entities allegedly engage in. Before we get into the substance of our presentation, I'd like to give you a little bit of background about CNA and about this project. So CNA is an independent, not-for-profit, and nonpartisan research institute in Arlington, Virginia. And we operate, and CNA operates two research arms. The Center for Naval Analyses is a federally funded research and development center, and CNA also, in, also runs the Institute for Public Research. Both of these are dedicated to providing independent and objective analyses to decision makers in all levels of government, as well as to informing the public discourse on critical domestic and international issues. CNA has a long history. It dates back to 1942. And our analysts have a wide range of expertise, ranging from the hard sciences to the social sciences. Heidi and I belong to CNA's China and Indo-Pacific Security Affairs Division, which focuses its research and analyses on what we regard as the most dynamic region in the world. One of the things that we're going to be doing today during this webinar is asking you all some questions to see whether what we are presenting is informing or aligning with your perspectives. So with that in mind, I would like to start by asking a question to everybody. China has the largest distant water fishing fleet globally, and we'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. But what we want to know is, do you think that the PRC, the People's Republic of China, is legally responsible for policing the behavior of those vessels? So if you take just a moment and answer either yes, you think that they are, no, you don't think they are, or, or you're not sure. We're just going to give everyone a moment to register their answers, and then we're going to uh, show uh, anonymously what the, what the answers are. So I'll give one more moment for everyone to answer. Great. So, as you can see, it looks like half the people think, yes, they are responsible, and half, half the people think, no, they're not. Nobody was unsure. Interesting. So I use this poll to make two points. And the first is that China's distant water fishing fleet is huge, and it operates globally, with estimates of its size ranging, but at the very least, it has 2,600 vessels. Moreover, though, there are hundreds of other PRC, PRC flagged vessels, including commercial shipping vessels, as well as government owned vessels and military ships. And these are all operating all around the globe. So that means that their collective behavior has the potential to have an enormous impact on the marine environment, fish stocks, and other maritime aspects that impact people whose, whose lives are tied to the maritime environment. Because of this fleet's vast size and the global area of operation, it is important, we think, that people understand what Beijing says these vessels are doing. But more importantly, it's crucial that people understand what these vessels are actually doing. My second point with this question is to highlight that Beijing is legally responsible for the behavior of PRC flagged vessels. <coughs> Excuse me. And my colleague Heidi will speak more about this shortly. <clears throat> so 
That is why we undertook this project, to gain a better understanding of how PRC actors are behaving in the international maritime domain. And how does that behavior compare to Beijing's policies? So the goal of this project was to provide an objective and unbiased analysis of any gaps between PRC policy and rhetoric regarding the maritime domain and the illicit activities that some PRC actors are reportedly engaging in. The approach that we used for this project hinged on us building out 15 case studies focusing on reported instances of illicit maritime behavior carried out by PRC actors over the last three years in the waters surrounding Southeast Asia, the Pacific Island countries, and along the Atlantic coast of Africa. So now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Heidi Holtz to discuss our data. Uh, thanks, Ryan. So for each of the 15 case studies, we looked at three things. Uh, first, we looked at the incident itself and the alleged illegal activity carried out by PRC actors. And for that, we looked at news media reporting from the affected country, uh, reports by NGOs, and data from uh, maritime domain awareness platforms and vessel tracking databases. And we did all this to get as complete a picture as possible of the PRC vessel or company's behavior. Second, we looked at what the PRC had to say about the incident or activity. And for that, we looked at PRC official statements, um, things like the daily press conferences held by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and government white papers. Uh, we also looked at PRC media reporting on the activity, especially if it was targeted at audiences in the affected countries or published in their languages. Uh, and finally, we looked at international maritime laws and regulations to understand which ones were being undermined or violated by the behavior of the PRC actors. So before we looked at specific cases, we wanted to understand what the PRC's general policies about how PRC vessels, individuals, and companies uh, were, should, or what their general policies were about how those actors uh, should behave in the international maritime domain. And according to Beijing stated policies, PRC actors should abide by the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, or UNCLOS, to which China is a signatory. And, uh, and this speaks to the question that, that Ryan just asked the audience uh, at the beginning of this presentation. Under Article 94 of UNCLOS, flag states like the PRC are responsible for ensuring that vessels flying the PRC flag comply with the maritime laws to which Beijing is a, sig is a, is a party or signatory. Um, Beijing is also responsible for holding violators of maritime laws accountable. Um, so to that, you know, to that end, Beijing calls on PRC vessels and companies to abide by local laws and regional frameworks where they're operating. Uh, PRC officials also publicly denounce illegal, unregulated, and unreported, or IUU, fishing, and have vowed to combat it within China's huge distant water fishing fleet. Um, and finally, according to PRC official statements, uh, Beijing's committed to safeguarding and protecting the marine environment, and it calls on PRC actors, um, PRC-based actors to do the same. So, with those policies in mind, how often do you, or do you think that um, PRC actors such as fishing vessels and companies follow these, op these policies when they're operating overseas? Do they do it most of the time, some of the time, or rarely? I'll give you all a moment to respond. And again, Ryan and I are doing this just to... Um, have an interactive portion to the uh, to the webinar and uh, to get a sense of you know whether what we're saying is affecting your views on the issues. 
So we'll give this one more second to let folks respond. Sure. Great, thanks everyone. So I'm gonna publish your poll here. Okay, some of the time, that's a fair answer. It looks like everyone's in agreement. So, well, I can't say for certain how often PRC actors follow Beijing's policies, uh, but I can say that it was relatively easy for us to identify at least 15 instances uh, in which they were accused of maritime violations in the last three years. Uh, which brings me to my next question. Uh, which violations do you think that they were accused of? Uh, ramming Senegalese and Brazilian vessels, uh, polluting the Gambia's waters, uh, forcing Indonesian fishermen to work on PRC fishing boats in violation of their rights, or all three of these things? Again, we'll give just two more seconds here. Sure. Well, um, the correct answer is all three. Uh, and Ryan's going to give you some examples about that now. So back over to you, Ryan. Thanks, Heidi. So the top line finding from our analysis is that some PRC actors do engage in a variety of illicit maritime activities that contradict Beijing's stated policies and official narratives about its role in the global maritime domain. And among the 15 cases that we examined, PRC actors were accused of being involved in the following six types of illegal activities. First, engaging in illegal unregulated and unreported fishing practices. And IUU, IUU fishing threatens ocean ecosystems and sustainable fisheries. Second, intentionally ramming foreign fishing vessels, damaging those vessels and endangering their crews. Third, using forced labor aboard fishing vessels and engaging in humans. Fourth, discharging marine pollution from vessels and land-based sources, which can harm the marine environment as well as injure local citizens. Fifth, tampering with or deactivating electronic tracking and monitoring devices in order to go dark so that those vessels can engage in illicit maritime activities without being tracked or monitored. And finally, sixth, illegally entering and illegally operating in other countries' jurisdictional waters. This graphic you see on the screen is a map showing the geographic range and the types of illicit maritime activities that we observed PRC actors engaging in within our 15 case studies. Now I'll move into a couple of examples of the types of PRC activities that we observed. I know that Heidi mentioned this during her summary of our data, but I wanted to foot stomp again here that all of our case studies relied heavily on local media reporting and local government reporting to inform our understanding of analysis, uh, our infor to our, inform our understanding and our analysis of the alleged PRC activity. So for example, the top image here is a Vietnamese fishing vessel after having been struck by a PRC Coast Guard ship. And that image is from Vietnam State News Agency, Tan Nien. The bottom image is a Philippines fishing boat having been struck by a PRC fishing vessel. That image is from the Philippines National Philippines News Agency. So in our case study on ramming, we observed five allegations of PRC vessels ramming foreign vessels in the last several years. And these foreign vessels came from the Philippines, Mauritania, Vietnam, Senegal, and Brazil. Well, what does the PRC say about ramming and about safety at sea? PRC official statements assert that PRC vessels strictly abide by maritime safety laws and norms. However, in response to critical regional reporting about PRC vessels ramming, at ramming other ships as well as other unsafe maneuvers, PRC officials and media have alternatively denied that these incidents occurred, blamed the other vessel that was struck, 
or just ignored the allegations altogether. Unsurprisingly, there are multiple laws that make intentionally ramming another ship illegal. A second example is that of PRC vessels and coastal infrastructure polluting local waters. The top satellite image is from a US imagery analysis company showing chlorophyll A blooms around stationary vessels allegedly from the PRC and anchored within the Philippines exclusive economic zone. These chlorophyll A blooms indicate sewage discharge over time, which is both illegal and can lead to ecosystem damage and further reduced fish stocks. The bottom image is from a Gambian reporter showing a lagoon preserve that was allegedly damaged by illegally discharged effluent from PRC fish meal factories. As you can see in the slide, the official narrative from Beijing is that China is a responsible steward of the maritime environment. But in response to these recent reports that indicate that some PRC actors have broken from that PRC policy, they respond by calling the reports, quote, fake news and efforts to, quote, smear China. In other words, PRC officials and authoritative media vocally deny the allegations and call them fake or politically motivated. As a final example today, this alleged behavior involves PRC flagged vessel, vessel operators exploiting dozens of Indonesian crew members, many of whom have died from illness, beatings, unsafe work conditions, or lack of food and water since 28, 2019. These labor abuses and deaths of Indonesian crew aboard PRC vessels have been documented by the Indonesian Migrant Workers Union, Indonesian media and officials, as well as by international NGOs. What does the PRC say about this? The official narrative from Be Beijing is that the PRC is a responsible fishing nation that wouldn't commit such labor abuses. And indeed, there is a PRC law designed to protect the rights of foreign crew aboard China's distant water fishing, distant water fishing vessels. However, faced again with multiple reports of rights abuses, the PRC Ministry of Foreign Affairs turned to saying that, quote, Report, reports of abuses are politically motivated false accusations. Similarly, PRC authoritative media published in Bahasa Indonesian and other languages called the reports, quote, lies designed to create contradiction between Indonesia and China. And finally, there are multiple international, regional, Indonesian and PRC laws that are, that are violated by this alleged activity. All right, and with that, I'm going to post one last poll and ask people, do you think that Beijing's responses to these allegations are consistent with its policies? <coughs> Excuse me, contradicts its policies, or you're unsure? So we'll give just a moment here. Great, thanks everybody. So it looks like a majority of people think that Beijing's responses contradict its policies. Well, some are unsure. Fair enough. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Heidi to go over our key takeaways. Yeah, thanks Ryan. So it looks like a majority of you thought that Beijing's responses contradicted its policies. And that's what we found too. Uh, our biggest takeaway from our research is that there is a consistent gap between PRC rhetoric, what China says, and the illegal behavior of some PRC actors in the international maritime domain. And perhaps unsurprisingly, given their numbers, uh, the most frequent offenders are members of China's huge distant water fishing fleet. Uh, now, the PRC's ruling Communist Party is very image conscious. It's concerned about China's international image, uh, and it seeks to minimize the negative impact of those allegations. And uh, 
from the examples that Ryan gave, you can see that it, it does this in three ways. Uh, it refuses to acknowledge the allegations, it denies them, uh, and sometimes PRC officials even go so far as to accuse the victims of being responsible for causing the incidents. And these efforts to downplay uh, or deny the illegal behavior of PRC actors contradict credible reports of bad behavior. Uh, in the cases that we looked at for this study, the illegal activity was reported by foreign authorities, NGOs, and news media, and these reports often included uh, supporting data from maritime domain awareness platforms, phishing logbooks, first-person interviews, uh, and even video and photo evidence. And in the face of such evidence, Beijing's responses uh, create the appearance that rather than acknowledge and address the behavior of these PRC actors and hold them accountable, um, Beijing is publicly subverting international rules, laws, and norms. And with that, I'll you know, hand it back over to Ryan to tell you a little bit more about the reports themselves. Thanks, Heidi. So I want to note here that we have translated all of our, translated our case studies as well as our key takeaways report into six languages. And those languages are those which are spoken by people in the countries where our case studies examined the illicit PRC maritime activities. So this is just a couple examples on your screen, but you can find our reports available in Arabic, Tagalog, Filipino, Bahasa, Indonesian, French, Khmer, and Malay. So please see the CNA website for these translated documents and feel free to share them with your colleagues and community members. I'll make sure to send around a link to everybody here uh, so that you know where to find them. They're not up on the website yet, but they should be within the next week or so, right, Ryan? That's right, that's right. So thank you all very much for listening to us present on our recently completed analysis on this important topic. And now we will turn to our panelists for regional views on the issue. Here's the order in which our panelists will go today. I ought to have said at the beginning that you will notice on your screen a, a, a group of distinguished panelists we have. But first, we're going to start with Imran Vitachi, the deputy managing, managing editor of Benar News, focused on Southeast Asia issues. So owing to some time differences, uh, we ended up recording Mr. Vitachi's presentation ahead of time. So I'm going to pull that up on my screen now, and he will present for 10 minutes. Away. Thanks to CNA for inviting me to speak here today. Before I begin, I'd like to tell you a little about Benar News. We're a unit of Radio Free Asia based in Washington and funded through a grant from the US government. We publish in five countries, five languages, and have a team of about 60 stringers scattered between the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, and Bangladesh. Through our partnership with RFA, we've added a correspondent who is solely dedicated to the South China Sea Beat. Today, I'll be talking about how our news organization covers the South China Sea story. We tell this big geopolitical story from different angles and what I call different altitudes. It's all about trying to make an impact while telling the story whether it's at the international relations level or down at the ground level, where the lives of ordinary people are affected. Share screen. Next slide. In its essence, the South China Sea story is about an Asian superpower and smaller neighbors competing for maritime resources and a territorial foothold in a strategic waterway. As it expands outward economically and militarily, 
China has been pushing the boundaries of its claims in the sea region. The lines are now being blurred. Ben Arnu started playing Ben Arnu started paying closer attention mm -hmm. to this story in June 2016, right before an international arbitration court ruled for the Philippines in Manila's lawsuit against Beijing in their dispute over the South China Sea. Next slide. It's worth noting that ch while China keeps sending its ships into the maritime EEZs of neighboring countries, Beijing remains among their top trade and investment partners, if not number one. China is financing big ticket infrastructure projects in those countries. This gives Beijing economic clout, which could explain why some South China Sea countries such as Malaysia and Indonesia are relatively soft in responding to intrusions by Chinese ships in their exclusive economic zones. Next slide. As I see it, Bernard News captures the South China Sea story from different altitudes. Sometimes we tell it from lower Earth orbit through the use of satellite images and platforms that, tra that track ship movements. At a lower altitude, let's call it 30,000 feet, we tell the story of how governments interact. Finally, we tell the story from ground and sea level by putting a human face to it so that our readers can see themselves in the story. Now I'll give you some examples of what I'm talking about. Next slide, please. Here, you're looking at satellite images we use to report on a diplomatic row between the Philippines and China earlier this year over the presence of hundreds of Chinese ships at a place called Whitson Reef. The reef is inside Manila's e exclusive economic zone. And at the time, this boomerang-shaped reef in the Spratly Islands is claimed by the Philippines, China, and Vietnam. Next slide. Then in November, we reported that Chinese ships were returning to Whitson Reef. Three days after Bernard News and Radio Free Asia came out with this story, Reports in Vietnamese media use the same satellite image we have used. According to these reports, based on this image, Hanoi demanded that China stop violating Vietnamese sovereignty in Whitson Reef. It looks to us that our reporting prompted Vietnam's reaction. Next slide. The story of the South China Sea also unfolds at the international relations level. This is where we report on what various governments are saying about the issue. And this is where we have a hard time getting Chinese embassies to comment, although we try in an effort to tell a fair and balanced story. For its part, the Chinese foreign ministry regularly denies that Chinese ships are intruding in the waters of other countries, claiming that this maritime territory is actually China's. And while this is going on, Chinese officials regularly talk about the need for joint efforts to safeguard stability in the maritime region. At a special China ASEAN summit last month, President Xi Jinping assured his Southeast Asian counterparts that his country was not a bully. He said this shortly after the Chinese Coast Guard fired water cannon at ships carrying supplies to a Philippine military outpost at 2nd Thomas Shoal. Next slide. The Philippines and Vietnam have been relatively outspoken in protesting China's intrusions into their EEZs. 
For example, the Philippine Foreign Secretary is known for his cursed filled complaints via Twitter. But Indonesia and Malaysia have been much quieter about Chinese maritime actions, as reflected in these quotes I posted here. Two years ago, in an interview with Banar News, Malaysia's then Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad conceded that, quote unquote, we have to accept that China is a big power. We don't go around trying to be aggressive when we don't have the capacity, he also said. Next slide. Mahathir acknowledged to us that his government had not, been, had not granted permission for a Chinese survey ship to operate off Borneo, where Malaysia's state-run oil company was conducting activities. In April and May 2020, the next Malaysian government did not issue any kind of public protest when Chinese ships sailed into the Malaysian EEZ and shadowed the West Capella, a Malaysian contracted drilling ship operating there. Next slide. Finally, we come to the ground level, where Banan News strives to put a human face to this geopolitical story. As an example, I'd like to share with you a video released by the Indonesian government that captures a confrontation near the Natuna Islands. The captions are by Banan News. China Coast Guard, China Coast Guard, 5302. This is Indonesian Coast Guard calling you over. Yes, sir, you are in Indonesian water, sir. Please move away and go back to your territory, sir. China has an indisputable sovereignty over the island in South China Sea under adjacent waters and enjoys sovereign rights under jurisdiction in the relevant. Saya ulang lagi, saya ke sini juga ingin memastikan penegakan hukum. I always get a kick out of watching this video. Next slide. My favorite example of a human story is this multimedia package we did to mark the fifth anniversary of the verdict in the landmark arbitration case that the Philippines brought against China. Our team of Philippine reporters spent a few days in fishing communities on the west coast of Luzon that have not reaped any benefits from the ruling. China has ignored it and blocked Filipino fishermen's access to prime fishing grounds to prime fishing grounds of Scarborough Shoal. Our reporters came back with a powerful story, which they told through photographs, video, and text. Quote, unquote, it just makes me sad that we can't fish in the same areas where we used to, fisherman Henry Lito Empok told Bernard News. We used to be able to go there and catch big fishes, making our lives easier, he said. Now they are driving us away and accusing us of poaching in our waters. You can take off the shared screen now. This is my favorite way to tell a story. I find it so much more interesting than the repetitive and opaque statements issued by government officials. To tell the story, of the South China Sea from different altitudes, we need to penetrate the rhetoric of official statements. We need to hold all governments, and I mean all governments, accountable for their words and actions. We also need to tell the story in plain language that everyone can understand. And we need to highlight the human angle. In this way, we can capture the big story and what it means for you and me. Thanks for listening. 
All right, so thank you to Imran for that presentation. And I see that Imran has joined us today, so he'll be able to answer any questions you might have about his presentation during the Q&A session. So next, we're going to turn to Leilani Reklai, who is an editor at Island Times in Palau. So I'm going to present Ms. Reklai's presentation. And Le Leilani, please take it away and let me know when you would like me to advance slides. And you're currently on mute. And if you need help unmuting, just let me know. Oh. Is that OK? Yes, great. We can hear you now. <laughs> All right, everybody. Um, thank you, uh, CNA, for the opportunity uh, extended to us as well. Uh, good evening from Palau. It's uh, 6.30 uh, p.m. Tonight, uh, over here. Um, just a little bit about Island Times. Uh, we are a uh, small local newspaper uh, in Palau, and our main focus is uh, uh, a, a local, uh, local readers and local constituents. Um, the China's uh, Palau is... Uh, 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 what we call an ocean state. It's, it's a famous <laughs> statement. Our, fa our, our former president called ourselves, we're a small island country, but we are a large ocean state. Uh, and as such, um, we, um, we've had, uh, we've, we've known that we have fishing, illegal fishing activities in our uh, waters for many, many years. But as a small island country with uh, about a population of 20,000 people, um, we've had a uh, very um, limited uh, capacity to fully uh, monitor our um, uh, maritime uh, uh, environment. Um, let's go on to the next slide, uh, if, we, if we may, right? Uh, yes, so we, we've, we've known uh, about the Chinese uh, illegal vessels in our waters for many years. Uh, we have uh, some of our southernmost uh, states, about 180 miles from our main uh, uh, island, um, you know, they they have a lot of experience with the Ch illegal Chinese uh, vessels. Um, they uh, been trading actually with them. Uh, uh, they have a, they have not been taking. Uh, um, uh, any, they have not confronted them uh, because most of the time they have more people on those fishing vessels than they were on the islands. So they have tried to uh, uh, work with them as, uh, you know, just to get the, our patrol boat from our main island to those uh, uh, island states. It takes about three days. So it's been a struggle for many years uh, for us to be able to uh, uh, take control of what's happening in the in our uh, in our waters. Uh, um, they've reported, uh, you know, the uh, the Chinese vessels. They have no, uh, they 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 have no respect for the local laws. Uh, they fish indiscriminately. Uh, most of the southern islands are rich uh, turtle uh, uh, nesting sites. They'll take everything. And uh, that's, that concern has been raised time and time again uh, to our national government, and we've tried uh, to, to, to um, control that. Um, and next uh, slide, if we may. Um, uh, the recently, in, uh, as far back as 1996, uh, we obtained a uh, patrol boat from Australia uh, and we try to use it to monitor uh, an EEZ that's the size of the uh, country of France. <laughs> so it's been quite a struggle to, to do so. Um, and then uh, we've, in the last 10 years, we have uh, been really working closely with our partners, uh, with the United States, with Japan, uh, Australia, um, and Taiwan, uh, to try to uh, Take control of our waters a little bit. Try to control what's happening. Um, back in the in in 2000 and uh, before 2009, we had cases where Chinese vessels were actually caught, uh, and they were filled with shark fins, and we were able to just confiscate that 
uh, take whatever was on the ship and let it go because we had we didn't really have resources to to deal with that. Uh, fortunately, we have uh, because of those cases, we have been able to uh, uh, put put out laws. Uh, Palau put out the the first uh, shark sanctuary uh, law in. 2009 and uh, tried to gain international uh, assistance in, in, in monitoring that, in, in trying to stop that uh, illegal fishing by the, the Chinese vessels. Um, we have been, I think, a little bit more successful in the last 10 years. Uh, again, uh, working with a lot of partners, uh, uh, not only uh, as mentioned earlier, but also with uh, other countries around us, like uh, the Federated States of Micronesia, uh, as well as uh, countries that are members of the uh, uh, Forum Fisheries, Pacific Forum Fisheries, to, to um, try to control this uh, un, uh, uh, illegal uh, and unregulated uh, fishing. Um, and uh, again, because of the, the Chinese illegal fishing, uh, especially the harvesting of, of uh, shark fins, uh, and uh, we were able to establish a law uh, as a result of that to, to make Palau uh, a shark sanctuary, prohibiting any harvesting of sharks whatsoever. Um, again, the depletion of fish, the fishing was indiscriminate. They'll take everything. Uh, turtles, uh, even including giant clams, um, uh, all over the Southwest Islands. Before they were reported to, uh, you know, were just thousands of them, and now you find almost none of it. And and these are a source of livelihood for those people that live in those uh, those uh, uh, out uh, uh, faraway islands, and and uh, it really had affected them. And unfortunately for us, and sadly for us we didn't have the resources to really protect them at the time. And so now we, we're really coming out with all these uh, uh, partners to try to, to control that. Um, we just recently, uh, last year actually, they were able to apprehend, and this is with assistance of the US Coast Guard, we were able to uh, 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 catch a Chinese fishing vessel that was again in the Southwest Island, uh, Southernmost Island, Helen Reef, um, and the the boat had over 500 pounds of sea cucumbers. Uh, they had all, all kinds of other uh, marine creatures on board. And uh, when the patrol boat arrived, they tried to bribe the officials that got there. So they were um, uh, escorted, they were brought in uh, by our patrol boats um, with the uh, Coast Guard, uh, US Coast Guard assistance. Uh, but because of COVID, we were only able to uh, strip the ships, take out everything that they had, and send send them back home. We, we, we they were not allowed to 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 leave the ship. So uh, it it's not uh, not as prevalent, I think, according to our, our reports. Uh, uh, they're still uh, still out there. They don't always uh, uh, turn on their identification. Um, uh, uh, location, uh, uh, what do you call those, location uh, equipment. So they are out there some, uh, most of the time, uh, you know, now with the assistance of Australia, we're able to see who's out there and who's not. But again, uh, we only have two patrol boats and by the time they get to the location, they would be would be gone. So there's still a lot more work going on over there. Um, but we have been getting a new, um, not new actually. Uh, we we're starting to see uh, because of all the partners that we have now in place, helping us to give us more eyes uh, out there. Uh, Chinese um, uh, survey or research vessels uh, coming into our waters unpermitted. Uh, to do uh, w whatever they do uh, without permit uh, and, and permission from our government. Uh, the uh, one, the first one they caught was in 2018, uh, and it has been, uh, according to the maritime uh, tracking, uh, uh, they were able. They note that it's been on the doing surveys back and forth along the Kyushu Palau Ridge. Um, the one that we just had this month, actually, it was seen entering our EEZ in November of 29th this year, and then it departed on uh, December uh, 4th. 
uh, uh, was uh, uh, a vessel called uh, the Yang Hao, and it was also uh, going back and forth over the um, uh, Kyushu Palau Ridge, and then it went uh, into a certain direction. It seems to be, according to uh, sources, uh, uh, tracking our fiber optic cable, submarine cable. Uh, we just had the first submarine cable connecting to the country in 2018. Um, this is the first time that they saw this. Uh, it was unfortunately, uh, our two patrol boats are too small to board this uh, ship. And so we requested assistance from the U.S. Coast Guard. And by the time they got here, they were already uh, outside of our EEZ, but right next to uh, our uh, border. So they're being observed at this time. Um, there's uh, monitoring to see uh, where they will they go next. So it's not just uh, the illegal fishing vessels, it's the Chinese um, uh, survey vessels uh, that are entering the waters without permission uh, in violation of the uh, international uh, uh, laws and clause. Um, and, and Palau had in the past, uh, uh, lodged our um, complaint, uh, our protest to the China's embassy in Konope. Uh, but because we do not have a diplomatic relations with uh, uh, China, uh, you know, the communications has not been as uh, smooth or, or we don't get response from them. They would ignore us. Uh, the only time that we received a lot of not direct responses, but we saw a lot of media uh, out of China, was the 2009 when uh, a Chinese fishing vessel was caught in our northern reef collecting giant clams. Uh, our, our patrol boat tried to stop them and they tried to evade them. And uh, our officers fired a warning shots. Unfortunately, a ricochet of one of the engines of the boat and killed one of the Chinese. Uh, who was on the fishing boat. So, uh, and they had this, uh, it was kind of, we, we thought was suspect they're supposed to be fishing boats, but they had uh, very fast, powerful, uh, small boats uh, with uh, uh, about three engines with 900 horsepowers on them. So we were wondering what, what they were catching with that kind of machinery. Uh, but they they did, uh, that took, that received a lot of, uh, media attention from China. And from my what I read, uh, they were saying they were uh, innocent, they were not illegally fishing, they were passing through um, uh, some of the comments that were made. But uh, we know of, uh, for sure that it, uh, you know, they were there for a couple of days. And unfortunately, uh, also as a result of that incident, we had sent out a, a small aircraft with the police officers to uh, monitor the, the, the ship and it never came back. So we, we don't know what happened to it. Uh, we lost two officers and a pilot on that small aircraft that went out to 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 watch over those ships. Um, but at the time, we didn't have the resources to really go out there and find what happened to that uh, small aircraft. Um, I should have put more <laughs> pictures here for for that. But it's you know it has a very uh, uh, a real impact on our uh, country because our. Second largest uh, economy is dependent on fisheries. And right now as a uh, PNA country, we get, uh, well, in 2016, we uh, uh, passed a law that made 80% of our AEZ as a sanctuary, a marine sanctuary, a no-take zone. Uh, and um, it's, it's part, of, uh, part of the money that comes to that goes to all the states to help the individual people in the community. And when this is compromised, it has a real impact on our uh, small population, but very dependent on this, uh, um, uh, on the waters and what comes out of our EEC. Um, that's, Ch China does not, as I said, we don't have uh, diplomatic relations. So uh, in retaliation for many of these policies and actions we took uh, against the, the fishing boats, 
uh, and, 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 the and the rhetoric for uh, uh, supporting uh, or, or being uh, in a relationship with uh, people uh, with the Republic of China, Taiwan. Um, China retaliated by, in 2016, by cutting off for uh, tourism to Palau or putting a stop to many of the companies that were promoting Palau. And uh, China's tourism represented at the time 80% of our tourism market. Um, I think they were trying to use the economic uh, impact of that to control uh, uh, and push Palau to where the direction that they wanted to uh, us to go. But uh, our government and our president stood firm uh, so it did affect our uh, economic, uh, uh, economy quite a bit, but we were able to uh, uh, stay, uh, we were able to re reinvent our tourism market and try to go for the high end as opposed to a large group of uh, tourists uh, that were coming from China. Uh, in 2018, uh, we do have a large Chinese investment on the island. In fact, it's probably the largest foreign investment. They have a lot of hotels uh, and other uh, infrastructure here. Um, but in 2018, the um, Chinese government put a, a restriction on the money that uh, what, money transfer uh, into Palau. So that put a lot of those business uh, brought a lot of those business to stand still. Um, but again, I, it was another move, I believe, by China to, to try to, you know, get Palau to, to um, act in the way they wanted to react. Uh, and uh, fortunately, it didn't, didn't work out the way they wanted to. Um, so that's, that's kind of a brief I have. Uh, not, I'm sorry, not a lot of pictures to show on this one. Well, thank you very much, Leilani. This, this was really interesting. And I noted to you ahead of uh, the webinar today that those most recent examples of the research vessels in, in the Palau EEZ were, were news to me and Heidi. So I think this was really um, um, brought, some, uh, brought some new cases that we probably could have covered in our research, um, but just uh, more recent than we had time to cover. So thank you very much. Uh, now we're going to turn over to let me pull up my screen. We're going to turn over to Chino Gaston, a uh, correspondent from the GMA network in the Philippines. Uh, so with that, let me turn it over to Chino, and you can let me know when you would like me to show your video right. and your images. Thank you, CNA, for having me. Um, before I start, Ryan, can we pull up uh, as uh, my background uh, photo for most of my talk? The, the 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 picture of um, that guy with a <laughs> waving at the coast guard ship there should be one yeah there yeah show okay all right that's actually me <laughs> waving at the coast guard ship yeah uh, from <laughs> a, from a small sandbar disputed sandbar off Pagasa Island so. Okay, so before I start, uh, let me uh, just give a short background on who I am. I'm a senior journalist from uh, working for GMA7. Uh, it's a Filipino broadcast network, meaning both TV and radio, as well as online news and um, video streaming. Um, as a disclaimer, all my observations here are mine alone and does not reflect the policies and views of my news organization. So with that out of the way, my presentation will be broken down into three parts. It's, um, well, first part will be covering the Chinese maritime militia and then the illicit activities we have observed, all, of course, from the perspective of a journalist. Observations and impact of the Chinese activities and also activities of other uh, nations in the disputed areas, meaning the impact on the ecosystem. And finally, the challenges for media covering um, U, yeah, UUI in the disputed areas. So, okay, so let me start. Um, since the late 1980s, the expansionist activities of China in the disputed waters of the South China Sea has been a sensitive and oftentimes polarizing topic for Filipinos. We have helplessly watched as the small fishermen shelters in mischief, Subi and other reefs evolved to huge artificial islands challenging our nation's sovereignty 
within our exclusive economic zones. Throughout the years, Filipino journalists have chronicled the birth of these artificial islands, the rise of the Chinese and presumably other fishing militias from, you know, Vietnam and other countries. I think uh, Taiwan also has. And the strategy of area denial that is effectively a silent occupation of Philippine territory. The distances and logistics involved in covering for journalists these stories are challenging and oftentimes reliant on government resources, which may or may not have helped or influenced the narrative throughout the years. To be clear and fair, there seems to be a difference between, uh, from my observation, between activities committed by Chinese poachers who have been caught smuggling wildlife uh, as exotic as pangolin meat, giant clams, and sea turtles compared to the area denial activities of the combined Chinese slash Navy slash Coast Guard slash militia occupation fleet. So from my observation, there are two illicit activities being done. One is area denial and the other one is plain old poaching of wildlife, whether maritime or wildlife from um, our forest, particularly in Palawan and Mindanao. So the militia occupation fleet, which uh, we'll refer to it as, as such, seems to be directly controlled by the PRC with very specific missions and mandates. We'll get to it later. These vessels usually still hauled and well-maintained do no fishing short of showing nets and moving about. They don't even shine their lights at night to indicate that you know there's um, fishing being done at night. At least those around Pagasa Islands we've seen they don't do any really don't do anything they just float in place and of course the other philippine occupied reefs and features we see this kind of behavior as well while one can argue that chinese territorial aggression does not necessarily equate to illegal fishing and other illicit activities the presence of the chinese coast guard and these militia vessels within our territory seriously hamper law enforcement efforts to police our own waters. So this has happened in the past. Um, um, Ryan, can you draw up this um, picture of the giant clams and the, the hold of one of the ships, the giant clams? Yeah, I think that, yeah, the, this one, the other, this, yeah, that, that picture was taken in 2012. Oh, upper, yeah, this one, the, the one in the middle, yeah. That picture was taken in 2012 uh, one of the incidents that triggered the standoff and ultimately occupation of Scarborough Shoal, um, that's somewhere west of the main island of Luzon, by the Chinese, is the seizure of a Chinese ship, that one, um, caught red-handed with tons of giant clams in its hold. Filipino authorities eventually had to release the Chinese boat, along with the, you know, their catch, which, of course ultimately culminated in the arbitral ruling, voiding China's excessive marital claims, particularly the Nine Dash Line. But practically, we lost control of that shoal. And up to now, Chinese militia and the Coast Guard have not left. Um, a little bit of good news for our fishermen there. I think uh, it was also mentioned in the Benar News uh, presentation earlier. Um, we, were, uh, we are now allowed I mean, somewhat to fish around that area. But, you know, China still has control over the inner lagoon uh, and pick number one uh, yeah uh, can you show Ryan the the dead sea turtles yeah uh, I personally covered the 2014 capture of uh, again a Chinese vessel it's old full of live uh, and decomposing sea turtles the freezer of the boat likewise had held frozen sea turtle meat uh, I don't know uh, for what it, uh, I've never eaten uh, sea turtle meat before but uh, from what I heard from fishermen is not really that appetizing but to what end I don't know so what happened they were jailed I mean the nine Chinese crew were jailed but after a year they served their uh, you know sentence meted out by the local court and they were released sadly a few of my countrymen were complicit in this scheme the Filipinos provided the turtles they had captured from Half Moon Shoal the Chinese were adding them to their catch so the, the Chinese were actually buying off local fishermen um, pick number three um, I think the last pick um, Ryan if you may um, yeah the, 
this early this year, hundreds of oh, sorry, um, yeah, this this year Vietnamese fishermen were also arrested by Philippine authorities for fishing without permits in presumably municipal or territorial waters. So that's well within the 15 kilometer territorial sea or 12 mile territorial sea in Tawi Tawi in the southern Philippines. Um, like many of the catch or uh, the people we accost or um, apprehend, uh, they are usually allowed to leave. Well, they through uh, because of you know yeah, diplomatic channels and then uh, of course um, Vietnam and Philippines have a fishing arrangement of some sort. Uh, unlike China and the Philippines, that you know there has been no such agreement so far. Okay, to be clear, not all poachers are Chinese. There have been instances of Malaysian and Vietnamese poachers as well. Okay, so uh, I have a, a short um, video that we would like to show. Uh, this is in Pagasa Island. This is our my report, which shows, um, you know, uh, fishermen basically saying that, you know, the activities around the area, the unregulated and unreported fishing has directly impacted fish catch. So, with your indulgence. Pagasa Island, para humuli ng isdang pang at pangbenta. Matapos ng ilang oras sa laot. Pero mga maliliit na isda na lang ang kanilang nakuha. Hindi pa ganoong karang. I apologize that the, uh, the buffering might be an issue here. I'll play for another five seconds and see if it loads. If not, I'll probably pause it and you can, you can describe it, Gino. Tulingan lang ang mga ngayong araw. Ibang-iba daw dati. Duda si Mang Larry, sampu ng mga kasama niyang mangingisda. Resulta rato ng illegal na paraan ng pangingisda. Chino, would you mind describing uh, a little bit more about this video so that um, so that folks can... Oh, you're on mute right now. All right, sorry. Um, yeah. Um, well, the, the report basically inter, uh, well, centers around the local fishermen in Pagasa Island. So this is the most, yeah, the western most holding our uh, occupied island of the Philippines. Um, there's a community there. There's uh, fresh water, so it's a habitable island although it's outside the exclusive economic zone of the Philippines. So the video talks about you know, the, the fishermen saying that uh, there are two observed illegal activities being done by foreigners or foreign vessels in the area. One would be Vietnamese, who, they, who the fishermen say use cyanide at night to catch live fish. And then area denial activities done by the Chinese. So the huge Chinese ships um, floating around Pagasa, very visible because it's very near one of the artificial islands of the Chinese in Subi. They don't fish. They just hang around, anchor in place or float in place and then just basically deny fishermen from going near those uh, artificial islands and then some of the, um, yeah, the, the better fishing grounds as well so and um, throughout the years the, the fishermen have observed that you know fish catch is dwindling uh, they mostly catch pelagic fish the mackerels the yeah the other uh, like, uh, the other smaller tunas but none of the reef fish anymore okay so uh, allow me to yeah if, if you still have time well, we have anecdotal evidence testimony to paint a clear before and after assessment of the impact of illegal fishing in the South China Sea. My instance, I had the opportunity to uh, visit Pagasa or Tito Island in early 2000s. And I, I can tell you, you know, um, the wildlife was so well, the marine environment was so good. Uh, there were manta rays uh, swimming under the boats. And then we, well, we had this opportunity to fish uh, while we were, you know, stranded there for a week. Uh, we could easily fill the boat with fish Amateur city dwellers like us could actually, you know, fill the boat with fish. Yeah. And then 
fast forward to 2020, I was there again. Uh, you know, I had a chance to dive um, one of those um, sandbars and, you know, there's, there's nothing left, really. As in, all the corals are dead. And then we also had our own buildings and um, infrastructure being put up in the island. So I think they effectively killed all the corals around that area. Okay. So, again, challenges. Moving forward, what do we do? The role of journalists in the complex issues surrounding the South China Sea is vital in terms of informing citizens from the different ASEAN states that is what is actually happening in the disputed areas. While individual journalistic efforts to highlight Chinese, Vietnamese, and other nationalities engaging in illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing may seem futile or ineffective, media has played its part and the actors in the region should play their parts as well. China has been painted as a bully, aggressor, and coercive demon, yet there's little effect or little to change its attitude and behavior. The nationalist in me chafes at the inaction from my own government. Yet one should also ask, realistically, is there anything else to be done that may have a positive income? As a journalist, I shall slog on and do my best to continually reporting on this issue. Which brings me to the next point and challenge for journalists covering this area, access to the disputed areas and access to credible images and real-time information. I mean, CNA may be providing us in the future with intelligence and, you know, information but in my experience government would rather keep people in the dark rather than show they are powerless before chinese aggression in the south china sea in the cases of the philippines the problem is compounded with you know very public um, admiration and preference of our president for chinese support and leadership access to pagasa island is uh, hindered as well because we have to ask permission to actually go and you know shoot from our own territories and our own islands but in recent years, images from AMTI, CSIS, and Similarity have given journalists information ahead of what government wants to project or reveal. So sometimes they're just forced to comment or act because there are images from satellites and from other agencies outside of the country that helps drive the discourse and champion the truth in this disputed part of the planet. So what do we need to continue exposing and writing about the devastation visited upon our marine ecosystem? Well, of course, information, intelligence, and timely images and video because from experience, government is forced to act when confronted by documentary evidence that may impact public perception. On a final note, China, uh, from our observation here in the country, is trying to engage. I had a conversation with Chinese officials last week during their Christmas party <laughs> where it was very apparent China is trying to, you know, uh, push for better relations, maybe because of the Winter Olympics. But, you know, they're trying to soften their stance a little bit, the hardline stance, not so anymore. In one of the official's words that, you know, we want to show that China is not a monster. But then that seems to be just the topic of the, the exact, the, you know, the point of this um, you know webinar that, you know, uh, a change in rhetoric may not necessarily translate to a change in policy on the ground or more accurately, a change of policy on the water. So that's all for me and thank you for having me. Back to you, Ryan. Well, that was that was great, Chino. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. And I know there'll be some questions um, for you during Q&A. Uh, so we see that uh, we do have one more panelist. He messaged me, um, and this is Nana Jojo Solomon, who is the acting president mm -hmm. of the Ghana National Canoe Fisherman Council. He, however, was having connection issues, so will not be joining us today. He sent along his presentation, which I will just briefly summarize, and then we can move into uh, a discussion, and attendees can pose questions to our panelists. And I know I certainly have some questions for our panelists, but really briefly, uh, Mr. Solomon's presentation has to do with the beneficially owned trawler fleet operating in Ghana's waters, and he points out that 90% of the trawlers that are operating in Ghana's waters are beneficially owned by PRC corporations. And what this means is that the, while on paper, there might be a local Ghanaian company that owns the vessel, the ultimate owner who reaps the benefits of the ownership is based in the People's Republic of China. He also notes that there is a legal prohibition against this foreign ownership structure in Ghana, essentially meaning that 90% of the 
vessels operating in, in Ghana's waters are owned illegally and operated illegally and benefit uh, Chinese companies, not local Ghanaian companies. He also summarizes um, a number, in, number of instances of forced labor conditions, uh, illegal fishing, as well as uh, poor living conditions and insufficient food, food and drinking water aboard these ships for Ghanaian fishermen aboard the PRC owned vessels. I'll leave it at that. I will note that within our compilation of case studies, we do a full case study on the beneficial ownership of Ghanaian trawlers uh, by PRC companies. So if you'd like to read more, uh, please check out our case studies. Uh, and if anybody has specific questions, uh, I can put you in touch with Mr. Solomon. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'd like to open it up uh, for Q&A. Uh, so attendees can please feel free to type questions into the Q&A box. Uh, if you would like to speak and ask your question aloud, uh, raise your hand using the raise hand function and I can allow you to talk from my, uh, from my host capabilities. Uh, so I'll give a minute here for people to type their questions in and <clears throat> uh, I know I certainly have a few questions so I'll pause for a moment and then I might launch into a question if I don't see one pop up in the next few seconds. So while people get started thinking about their own questions, I'd like to ask the question about uh, what do our panelists think would help change the calculus for Beijing with respect to curbing some of these illicit and illegal activities that reportedly are going on within their distant water fishing fleet. And as Leilani pointed out, also with illegal incursions by research vessels, et cetera. So Chino, you just summarized that there has been a lot of press reporting uh, that is calling out bad behavior when it's seen and in your estimation hasn't really changed the calculus for Beijing. The trends don't seem to be going down. So if that is the, if that's the current state of affairs, what if anything can we do, can uh, stakeholders in countries all around the world who are dealing with this prob problem, what can be done that might help change the calculus in Beijing or within the uh, fleet owners themselves or with any other actors who have equities and the ability to influence what's going on uh, around the globe. So anybody feel free to jump in here uh, at this point to answer that question or if any of the panelists heard anything from other panelists that they'd like to address, also feel free to jump in here. Um, Brian? Uh, Brian, can I? Go, yes, go ahead, yeah. Chino. Yeah, yeah, at, at least from my perspective, from the Philippines, um, I suspect that short of uh, Chinese initiated and led code of conduct in the South China Sea among the claimant ASEAN states, um, short of having that, um, China will not be forced to, or yeah, forced to modify its behavior. Um, and it may be, well, it may be reasonable to um, also suspect that, you know, it's, it's intentionally, <laughs> intentionally, allowing illicit activity so that you know the, the the people with more to lose from um dwindling fish stocks would be eventually forced to um go to the table and negotiate with china through a bilateral agreement or yeah signing that lopsided code of conduct in the south china sea uh to stop the 
huge impact that these huge fishing fleets are you know visiting upon the marine ecosystem and then maybe then would china would say okay stop because you know the way that china is built it's it's uh it's hard to believe that you know these are independent actors just you know devastating the environment and doing their thing without fear of repercussions from you know the the chinese government and we've seen how they punish <laughs> those they deem um, you know going against the trend of government or going against the interests of the communist party so you know that, that at, least, at least that's my observation i think my my estimation of what's actually happening there okay thanks for that chino so i've got plenty of questions and i'm going to keep throwing them out there uh maybe for leilani or imran have you observed either in palau or imran from your perspective <clears throat> As a, as a journalist based here in DC, whether there are any trends upward or downward with respect to decreasing IUU fishing by PRC vessels over the last several years as the number of international media reports have called out the bad behavior or uh, do you see that trends have continued the same way with IUU, or have they decreased, have they increased, either in Palau or in Southeast Asia? And not just IUU, but do you observe any other trends over time with respect to PRC actors' behavior or illicit activities uh, in the waters that you're paying attention to? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Imran, we can hear you. Yes, uh, good morning to you. Um, I would say that, um, you know, I, I said at the beginning that we've been covering the South China Sea deeply, the issue of the South China Sea deeply since 2016, June 2016. Um, and it was around that time that the uh, tensions between Indonesia and China began to intensify over illegal fishing by Chinese Chinese and other ships in the in the EEZ off the Natuna Islands. Uh, since then, China had uh, Indonesia has been deploying more and more military uh, resources to the area, and despite all the coverage and reporting, there still is an incre the the issue of uh, illegal fishing or the the presence of Chinese survey ships in the Natuna Islands doesn't seem to be going away. That's, that's my observation. Thank you, Imran. So we do have, Leilani, if you have an answer, please. Yes. Um, we've, I think we've, we've seen a decline uh, simply because of the, uh, our loss uh, that uh, um, uh, uh, close off 80% of our EEZ to any fishing activity. Uh, so that, I think that is, uh, you know, we see less of that. Before, when we was open uh, for fishing, we had uh, companies, it was mentioned, I believe by Chino, there were, there were local companies that were local uh, in the name, but uh, we knew that the owners behind the companies were Chinese uh, and they were uh, actively fishing within the, the EZ. But since then, since all fishing has been closed off with very limited fishing within the 20% and only the Japanese uh, allowed for now, um, we see less of that. And, and I think uh, they're still there, but I think we, we're not running into them as, as often as we uh, had in the past. But as we said, last, last December, we we, we caught one of Helen Reef, so that doesn't mean that they're not there anymore. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Leilani. So there is a question in the Q&A, and I know that Chino has uh, one response to it. I also have one response to it. I'm going to read the question, and it says that CNA's research found that there are national policies existing within China that are violated by these recorded illicit activities. The question is, are there any evidence of Beijing following up with any of these incidences and punishing them, 
despite the rhetoric in the media. So there, we did observe that Beijing has initiated a new law with respect to IUU fishing and, their, and uh, an effort to clamp down on IUU fishing within China's distant water fishing fleet. This is what is referred to as their blacklisting law, which what it does is when regional fishery maritime organizations lodge formal complaints of IUU fishing against a particular PRC flagged vessel, after a number of formal complaints, the PRC government can then choose to uh, cut fuel subsidies and has the ability to ultimately revoke that vessel's license. This is something new and we haven't seen a lot of evidence that it is actually having an effect on IUU fishing within the distant water fishing fleet. But this is something that we are tracking and if it were to work and it were to have an impact to reduce IUU fishing, uh, this would be a great policy because there need to from both a unclassed legal perspective and also from a responsibility perspective, there need to be repercussions for the vessels that conduct this illegal activity. And then Chino, you've answered this as well. Would you like to chime in with your what your observation has been? Well, there have, I had had no access to actual um, Chinese fishermen um, saying that they've been actually punished, but uh, I think in 2018 or 2019, when um, the Chinese fishing boat um, rammed the uh, Jemvir, one of the Filipino uh, fishing wooden fishing boats in Reed Bank, um, it's a big incident. And you know, um, after a few a few weeks of investigation, and then of course denials from the Chinese embassy, eventually. Um, someone confessed or someone owed up to the accident. It was the, they, they, they told us it was the actual owner of the fishing boat, the Chinese owned the fishing boat. And then they said that, you know, they were, they, they were sorry for what happened. And they actually um, sent money, not officially, not through the Chinese embassy, but through a local Chinese business groups to compensate or you know pay back the Filipino fishermen who lost their um, lost their boats and almost lost their lives. But you know uh, there are individual efforts to you know mend or somewhat soften the image of China. But you know officially, government has yet to show. I mean the Chinese government has yet to show that you know it's willing to punish. Um, um, you know, violators of uh, environmental laws here in the um, West Philippines or the South China Sea, depending on who you ask. <laughs> Thank you, Chino. So we're closing in on our one and a half hour mark. There are three minutes left. Um, if anybody has any final questions for us or our panelists, please feel free to uh, send those in now. Uh, I will again just uh, uh, mention that all of our reports and our analyses will be publicly available over the next week. I will be sending out links to everybody who registered for this webinar along with our panelists so they'll be able to download those. Uh, and that is most of, uh, that's the most of our, that's, that's our presentation from us. Heidi, do you have any closing remarks? No, I'd just like to thank our panelists again. Um, thank you very much for taking the time. Um, early morning for Imran, you're on our time zone. Uh, Leilani, Chino, thank you very much for uh, joining us and sharing your perspective. It's, it's very helpful for us to, to uh, have an on-the-ground perspective or on-the-water perspective of what's going on in your neck of the woods. So we really, really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, and with that, I will also say thank you very much, Leilani, Imran, Chino, and, uh, and Jojo for preparing your presentations and again, providing your, your on the ground or on the water, as Heidi said, perspectives. <laughs> um, have a great day, everybody, and we'll be following up with you with the reports and a recording of this webinar after the events. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank you, guys.
Bye. Thank you. Bye.